This episode, we take a look at the golden age of flying. We're imagining ourselves back in the day, when airlines were glamorous, and you ate like royalty with fine china and silver cutlery, where the corks popped and the caviar and champagne flowed. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This is your captain. Welcome to the jet age. We'll be covering 4,800 miles in eight hours, and we'll be in the smooth air above the weather Cruising in sunshine all the way. This is the golden age of flying. Welcome back to the Ritzy Travel Guide. My name is Bill and it's great to have you along with us. This is the second video in a four-part series where we focus on how traveling used to be. Back in episode one, we reminisced on how ocean liners and cruising delighted us in the heyday. And if you haven't looked at that video, please take a look after this. Right, let's get into our time machine, smarten our cravats, straighten our shoulders back. We're going to be dipping into the archives. At times you'll be surprised, you'll laugh, and most of the time, a tiny little part of you may wish that you'd been there to be a part of it all. In fact, some of you watching now might well have been there, so keep a look out for yourself. You may pop up. Let's start off by imagining we're in 1958. Here we go, let's get ourselves checked in at the terminal. So glamorous, so 1950s, looking so avant-garde for the time, and real paper tickets issued. Passengers dressed in their finest to fly. Airlines started taking a leaf out of the cruise line's publicity book by promoting flying as a sense of occasion. Just like the cruise companies wanted to project an image of luxurious travel, so did the airlines. They said that flying should be an event, a celebration, where the journey was as important as the destination. For some, it's a first flight, while others are seasoned air travelers. There's no thrill like the thrill of going aboard. Isn't this plane a beauty? You've waited a long time for this moment, and just think it's going to be your home base for the next few days as you flip from one vacation resort to another. One look at the plane's interior, and you know you're going to live like a millionaire during your vacation. Four takeoff check, please. Auto feathering. I'm going right on. Reset on, volume's normal. Propeller pitch. Fully fine. We've checked tank to engine. Boost the power. Ignition switches. Checked on both. Trails and trim tabs. Flipper 100, you're clear to taxi to runway 25 left. By taxiway Charlie and runway 13 left. Ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff, sir. Stand by for takeoff. Hold up, free. And now we're skyborne, amid all the comforts of a luxury hotel. Flying was portrayed as an upmarket experience. Technically, there was only one class of passenger for a while. The one we now consider first class. Let's listen in to some commentary of the day. Time flies quickly when one is happy and comfortable. Tea time is always a treat on this airline, as the pretty stewardess passes delicious sandwiches and knickknacks. Passengers choose whatever diversion they prefer. Those who discovered a mutual interest at luncheon today settle down to a game of cards. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We are now at cruising altitude, 35,000 feet. Indications are that our arrival at London Airport may be ahead of schedule. The temperature there is 64 degrees and the weather is clear. If you haven't already changed your watches to conform to the time difference, I suggest you do so now. The planes were spacious with unbelievably generous legroom. Passengers dressed to impress, happily donning their twin set and pearls. Riding an airplane made you feel like a movie star, and the airlines encouraged you to dress accordingly. As one put it, come aboard as if you're going out to a night at the theater or the opera. Now we have to remember that in the 1950s, flying was exclusively the preserve of the wealthy. To fly from one side of America to the other in the mid 50s, cost approximately 10 times what it does today. So you paid a fortune for it, but you got a pretty extravagant experience in return. As we prepare with thrilling anticipation for the first stop on our holiday house party. And yes, that was smoking you saw, and we'll come back to that point a little bit later in the video. As we go through a list of things that you could do then, but you definitely can't do now. Wow. 
what a delightful way to have a dream take wing. And what a pleasant place to say, I'm hungry, as a steward is serving us dinner. This food is excellent, I say. It was really delicious. It really was fine dining back in the day. Proper cutlery, proper glasses, and silverware, where the corks popped and the caviar and champagne flowed. To attract the Whale Hill passenger and also help pass the time on board, meals could take two to three hours, and the menu included dishes like lobster and steak and free-flowing champagne. It really did match the cruise lines. Even the lower classes ate and drank like millionaires. Here's what dining on cruises looked back in the day aboard the Queen Elizabeth in the 1950s, and then here aboard a plane on the same era. Airlines paid world-famous chefs to create menus in flight that would rival Michelin-star restaurants back on the ground, with lavish buffets and trolleys grooning with goodies. In fact, one of the major reasons why airfares were so high was because of the unlimited access to free drinks and overflowing champagne and gourmet food. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please do give it a thumbs up as it lets us know we're on the right track and you'd like to see more of this type of material. Now, when you look at these old newsreels, it's quite fascinating to see what you could do back in the day and you definitely can't do anymore. And first off to mention, you could smoke. In-flight bans on smoking didn't begin until the 1970s and 80s, and that was only for a few airlines. And of course, in-flight entertainment hadn't been started, so good old-fashioned hobbies were the order of the day. The travelling chessboard came out, remember those? Time for a game before the drinks trolley swept by. What else could you do back in the day? Well, you could sleep on the plane, and I don't mean in your chair. Here, take a look. Where your overhead hand luggage goes now, back in the day, compartments folded down for you to sleep in. And when I was ready to turn in, there was a big soft bed already prepared. Here I'm out over the Atlantic and missing none of the comforts of home. Would you have liked this? To us, it may seem a bit claustrophobic, but to them, it felt like the high life. Incredible things. Yesterday, New York. This morning, far out over the Atlantic, some of my fellow passengers were having breakfast in Ben. In a moment, we're going to look at how flying was in the groovy 60s and 70s. But first, just to let you know, a quick note about our channel. Here at the Ritzy Travel Guide, we're now on Instagram. I know it's been a long time coming. So if you want to know what we're up to almost in real time between our YouTube videos going out, you can check and find us here on Instagram, also under the name Ritzy Travel Guide. And I've put a link in the bio and description of this video. So follow us along on Instagram. So now that we've eaten and drank ourselves into the ground on board these flights, how about a thought for the ladies and gentlemen who are serving us on board? and synonymous with the 1950s with the girls, the air stewardesses or air hostesses as they were called back in the day and they couldn't just arrive at their job, no, no, no they need to go to a special training academy let's take a peep Our story begins in an office application for position as airline hostess I've wanted to be a hostess since I was 18 and so one month later Mary stands in front of the McConnell School in Minneapolis. The next few days are a whirl. Interviews. Dorm assignment. Pictures of me before. New hairdo. In the afternoon, there are two hours of exercises called comportment classes. These girls are 21 to 28, stand 5'2 to 5'7. A hostess does plenty of knee bends in the narrow aisle of an airplane. And these teeter boards develop balance important in rough weather when her nonchalant poise reassures jittery passenger from jousting to the conga all in the interest of grace rhythm and the body beautiful makeup courses enhance the girl's natural loveliness and apparently the airlines and the bachelors enjoy similar tastes on the fifth week of the eight-week course a crucial moment did they like her will she get the job and then a letter comes 
me. I got the job. Congratulations, Mary. You've done very well here. Now, as alcohol was so free-flowing back in the day, I wonder what special training they got to handle the odd drunk passenger. No, Mary isn't airborne yet. But this mock-up plane makes a lot of interesting trips. It's part of her course in hostess duties and procedures. And her passengers are trained to be difficult. Oh dear, they rang in a Mr. Tipsy on me. What do I do now? Very simple, Mary. Watch teacher. First, make brother Tipsy comfortable. He may sleep the flight through. If he's still rambunctious, call the captain. Okay, rambunctious passenger firmly put back in his place. What about tray etiquette? Meal time. There's an art to serving it, too. Trays are to be carried sideways, not front and back. This method is more graceful, makes serving easier, lessens risk of spilling. Much, much better, Miss Ray. Here comes double trouble. I'm sorry, sir, no tipping. Good, and that's right. If he gets amorous, say nothing and stay away for the rest of the trip. Uh-oh, Mr. Tipsy again. What now, Miss Ray? Tipsy fails, you pass. Two weeks later, Mary gets her coveted wings at LaGuardia Field, New York. So long, Mary. Keep them smiling. Keep them smiling, indeed. Don't you just love infotainment reels from back in the day? Now, to get people in the air, you also had to be convinced that the planes were safe to fly in because there was also a fairly shocking track record of air safety in the 1950s and 1960s. Enter the safety department. You can travel 21,184,000 miles before you can reasonably expect to be killed in an air accident. How comforting! Here in Movements Control, the world is at their fingertips. They turn messages picked out of the air by radio into a running record of every speedbird on the global air routes. Each light means an aircraft on its way. Each model a speedbird over the world, watched by the monitors in Movements Control. In the background, reservation staff in touch with colleagues everywhere. Keep track of people moving between six continents and many countries. This is the IC Control. Understand you off London on time. I have a message for you. I have a message here, reference two baby elephants arriving on the 701 today. Glimpse behind the scenes. The wonders of radio and radar that now, according to statistics, render you safer in the air than in your own home. But you do have to remember that flying back in the 50s and 60s was a lot more dangerous than it is today. And the main reason, turbulence. They flew a lot lower than now. So planes of the day were loud, vibrated fiercely, and were often grounded due to the weather. So as flying back in the day took many hours to get from A to B, how were you supposed to pass the time on board that flight? Well, apparently getting blind drunk. Where else to do that but on board the newly designed lounges? As the decades went by, airlines really wanted to try and have their own identity. It wasn't just about appealing to the wealthy and famous. They wanted to tell everyone that it was the best experience in the air. And later, I had a nightcap in the lounge downstairs. Imagine, 20,000 feet over the sea. And when I was ready to turn in, there was a big soft bed already prepared. Here I'm out over the Atlantic and missing none of the comforts of home. Just like the cruise line started introducing ever more varied outlets on ships, the airlines tried to squeeze in just about anything they could on the plane, which was more difficult than cruise ships as there was far less space, but they tried their best. Back in the day, some planes were designed with viewing lounges, mimicking the observation cars you might find on an exclusive train. As flying became more trusted and increasing numbers were taking to the skies, the airlines wanted you to fly international. And one of the ways that airlines could hope to tempt you to long-haul flying was to promise you sights you just couldn't get at home. Pan Am was the major US airline spearheading its overseas routes. Six and a half magic hours to Europe, New York to London, in the same time that it takes you to go and see a baseball doubleheader. And in England, BOAC was gearing up its worldwide business. And being in England in the 1950s, you had to sound very posh with a clipped accent. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you may now unfasten your seatbelts and smoke if you wish. We shall be serving you with cocktails and lunch and afternoon tea. Even the airport announcers would sound like the Queen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking from the flight deck. On the left-hand side of the aircraft, you can now see the famous Victoria Falls. At the airports from London to Rio and Dum Dum, you can sample the stir and bustle that never ceases the clock round. And out of the left-hand windows, you can see the Schwedegon Golden Pagoda. The airlines got ever more adventurous, travelling further and further afield. She'll travel at 300 miles an hour or more, and fly at any height from five to 30,000 feet. It is easy to see the world now that flight has conquered time. It is easy to know one's neighbours now that space has shrunk. One of the most cleverly scripted pieces of copywriting about travel in the 50s. 5,000, 10, 20,000 feet above the path Columbus took. This is the way of the modern explorer. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please return to your seats, fasten your seatbelts, and extinguish your cigarettes in preparation for landing at Montego Bay. Everywhere the beauty and brilliant sun of the tropics that bid us linger at every stage of the world's most perfect island-hopping holiday. The gentle swaying of its palm trees, undulating silhouettes against the ever-clear skies. The towns on the Caribbean islands are a quaint mixture of old and new, where those with an eye for hidden beauty can look through a boat's glass panel as through a window at the exotic sea gardens of Montego Bay. The flying fish propels itself out of the water with vigorous thrusts of its tail. For the souvenir hunter, the Jamaican boatman will gladly dive into the bay to rescue, with great discrimination, some exquisite piece of coral. By the way, please do leave your thoughts in the comments box below. We always love to hear from people. Now, if you're going to be travelling overseas, you need to put out some adverts. Here's one for India. This is the latest design adopted by Air India for their stewardesses that fly around the world. And now the harassed passenger crossing the Atlantic has the beauty of the Orient at his elbow, giving him the comforts the air travellers expect. They say the sari is the loveliest dress ever invented. And here, saris have become official uniforms. Here's a girl preparing to do an important, and some would say an exciting job, giving him the comforts the air travellers expect. Now feminine frills and gossamer glamour have taken to the air, bringing a touch of colour to the tarmac at London Airport when these shimmering shepherdesses bring their charges to the airport bus. How about that? Shimmering shepherdesses. And if you get the namaste greeting, the traditional Hindu way of saying happy landings, you'll be one of those contented people who know that they haven't missed the bus. What fortunate men! In a moment, we're going to look at how flying was in the groovy 60s and 70s. But first, as the 60s and 70s rolled on, adverts got more quirky. Why not hire a Hollywood icon of the day, Peter Sellers, to flog your flights? Hello there! <laughs> May I be blunt? Flying in the USA, I find it difficult to tell one airline from another. But that's all been changed, you think? TWA introduces Trans World Service. You'll enjoy wines of the world over Washington. Continental cuisine over Colorado. Quiche Lorraine. Lovely fresh chips. So ask your travel agent about Transworld service and get a taste of Europe at 30,000 feet. What? Keep in touch! So we've arrived at the swinging and groovy 60s and 70s. The airlines had now seen off many of the old cruise lines who were considered anachronism and old-fashioned. So the airlines wanted to revamp their image a little bit. Bright colours were in, funky clothing and glamorous hairdos. And to usher in all of this, 1969 brought in the most significant plane of the era, the 747 Jumbo Jet. Your story? Assignment 747. Yes, sir. I'm on my way. It was big, brash, and an emblem for everything new. The huge size of the plane enabled the design crews to go wild. All that space to stuff in every conceivable amenity you could think of. Remember what it was like before there was somebody else up there who loved you? There was no such thing as executive class service to Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. With first class leg room, free cocktails for everyone, 
and a schedule you could depend on. And 1970 was the last hurrah of big spending for the airlines. With so much airline competition, they were all trying ever bizarre stunts to get passengers aboard. But it all had to come to an end with years of overspending and along with the oil crisis of the 1970s, airlines had just splashed too much. Just a few short years after introducing these lavish bars and lounges, they were eventually stripped out, put in more seats, get more money in, and the lobster and gourmet dining went. And from then on, flying resembled pretty much what it is today. Will we ever get to fly and feel like we did in the 1950s again? I very much doubt it. In many ways, traveling back in the golden days was a lot simpler than it is now. There were no security checks, no searches, and no identification required. You simply showed up at the airport, checked in, and boarded the plane. But we do have the fabulous newsreels of the time to remember it by. I do hope you enjoyed this look back to the golden days of aviation. Do remember to subscribe to our channel. It doesn't cost you anything and lets you know when the next episode is coming out. For cruise lovers, we'll be aboard for very different types of ships in coming months, and we'll be putting out travelogues and reviews for those. From Cunard to Azamara, to Virgin Voyages, and to Holland America, so plenty to come. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ritzy Travel Guide. It's been an absolute pleasure having you along with us. In the meantime, on our channel, we have several videos for you to go and look at now. Right here is part one of this travelogue series in the 1950s. You can see the golden age of cruising. And over here, we have several other videos for you to amuse yourself. And we'll see you now in one of those.